एवरीवन वेलकम टू लाइव लेक्चर सेशन ऑफ स्वयं प्रभा चानू आई एम रिया प्रभा वी आर स्टडिंग इंडियन गवर्नमेंट एंड पॉलिटिक्स हुज कोर्स कोड इज बीपीएससी 132 दिस सेशन विल बी द लास्ट सेशन ऑफ दिस पेपर दैट इज इंडियन गवर्नमेंट एंड पॉलिटिक्स आई विल बी कवरिंग यूनिट 14 दैट इज कम्युनलिज्म एंड यूनिट 15 दैट इज पार्टीज एंड पार्टी सिस्टम इन टुडेस सेशन सो दिस विल बी द लास्ट सेशन ऑफ दिस पेपर we have completed uh, other units in our previous sessions so let's start with unit 14 that is communalism so to introduce what is communalism uh, i must say that uh, in the last session we have discussed about secularism and in this class we are talking about communalism so identity forms an important aspect of life of an individual or group in a society so we have already talked about identities in our previous session where we have learned about peasants and workers movements and uh, people having different religious identities so here we can say that identity forms an important aspect of life of an individual or a group in a society in a diverse society like india there are multiple factors that whether it is our geographical location where our gender our race our caste our class our education background there are multiple factors which shapes our identity such factors are culture language religion customs history region economy etc so because our country is such a big in its territory and because of its population it is diverse in nature and that is the reason why there are so many languages so many cultures ethnicity history region there are so many diversified things in our country the numbers and effectiveness of the factors depend on the context in which identities are formed so sometime a single or some of them plays more dominant role than the other factors so it is not like that a person is having only a one identity of its language he must be belong to a religion he he uh, must be performing some kind of customs he has some kind of uh, history uh, his economic capacities must be different so a person have several identities together so this is true of the role of religion also in shaping an identity so religion shapes our identity and it is one of the most important identity which we are talking about in today's class as india is a multi religious society by multi religious we mean to say that there are multiple religions residing in our country uh, there is uh, hinduism islam christianity buddhism zoroastrians sikhism jainism and there are multiple more religions residing in this land so it is relevant to understand how religion helps in shaping identities of the people so in this unit we will be talking about how this religion shapes the identity of the person communalism what is communalism this is very important to know communalism is an ideology which shapes the vision of members of a community formed on the basis of common religion about themselves other religious communities nationalism and the state so it is a ideology which shapes the vision of a member of a community in book india struggle for freedom it is a very famous book written by bipin chandra and others so in this book it underlines that communal ideology consists of three elements so the book indians uh, indians struggle for freedom it talks about the three elements regarding communal ideology let's see what are these elements the first element underlines the belief that people from similar religion community have similar secular interest such as political economic social and cultural interest the authors of the book term it as the first bedrock of communal ideology so it is a kind of belief among the people that a particular religious community have particular interest in politics economics and in society and cultural so in this part uh, the authors of this book the book's name is india struggle for freedom in this book the author say that it is the first bedrock of communal ideology 
the second element denotes that the people belonging to different religious communities do not have common secular interest that is social economic cultural or political interest so the second element talks about that people of different religions have separate identities separate uh, interest and they don't uh, have same or common interest so there is a difference the third element talks about or shows a stage in which the relations between different religious communities are seen as mutually incompatible hostile and antagonistic so in the third element they are saying about the relations the difference between these religious communities they say that they can't be uh, compatible they can't, their relations will be hostile so these are the elements which bipin chandra and other talks about communalism is linked to another concept that is communal violence both are different but interrelated so when we talk about communalism in day to day life we often refer communalism as violence so it is a concept which is linked with each other which are interrelated with each other but they are different communalism is a consciousness and when this consciousness gets expressed in terms of violence between two different religious communities it is called communal violence so what does communalism mean it is a kind of consciousness among the persons regarding their religion and when this consciousness turned into violence we call it as communal violence different religious communities do not belong uh, do not become communal on their own so it is also seen that they don't become communal in nature on their own nor do their relations turn into communal violence automatically so it is not like that that it will turn automatically hostile they will be feeling incompatible with each other no this doesn't happen automatically religious communities are turned into communal communities by certain sections of society so the society plays a very important role in turning a religious community into a communal community and they can convert relations between such community into communal riots so because of the involvement of some sections of the society this relation between the religions uh, turned into a communal riot such sections can be political leaders activists middle classes or community leaders so who are they who uh, just uh, convert these uh, religious relations into communal riots they are basically the political leaders activists middle classes or community leaders they explain to the members of their respective uh, communities that the other community is responsible for their problem so it is some kind of a blame game which uh, used to Uh, happen behind these communal riots where a particular person uh, informs or explain to their community members that whatever is happening with them it is the fault of the other party so there are uh, several approaches of communalism we will be talking about three approaches here the very first approach is empirical approach so the empirical approach is used by various scholars like ashkar ali where different communal riots were studied and general conclusions have been drawn so here ashkar ali what he did he tried to uh, read he tried to study the communal riots and try to generate a general conclusion he tried to draw a general conclusion after studying these communal riots Amrita Basu, Paul Bras, Ashutosh Vashne, etc., can be seen to have followed this approach to test their theories. So, not only Ashkar Ali, but there were uh, several authors, several researchers who also used this approach for their study to test their theories. So, empirical approach, what it did? It tries to study the communal rights and it tries to reach a general conclusion after studying these rights. next comes the materialist approach materialist approach argues for foregrounding the study and understanding the social conditions which included the role of nature of the state material conditions in which community formations are taking place etc 
to understand the formation of the ideology of communism. So it tries to study and understand the social conditions which includes the role and nature of the state, material conditions in which community formations are taking place to understand the idea or the ideology of communism. The episodes of communal violence are studied as a reflection of these fundamental situations. So KT Shah, Bipin Chandra, Achin Vinayak and others are practitioners of this approach. So these thinkers, uh, they practice this materialist approach where they try to see what are the social conditions behind the rise of this ideology of communism. Next comes the essentialist approach. Essentialist approach means where the communities are already seen to be different, living across fault lines with essential separate and defined mutual relationship. So Huntington, uh, Samuel Huntington, the American political scientist, in his very celebrated book, Clash of Civilizations, has presented an outline of such approach. So this essentialist approach, what it did, it tries to identify communities who are already seen to living uh, in a, across a fault line. So the, uh, the practitioner of this approach is uh, Samuel Huntington, whose uh, book that is very famous, the, the Clash of Civilizations, he presented an outline of such approach in his book. Now, let's talk about from where the communalism originated in our country. So, communalism as a belief or an ideology has been the product of the colonial rule in India. So, if we try to trace the origination of this communal ideology in our country, we will be finding that it is it started in the colonial period in our India. In this sense, it is the product of modern times in India. So people were living, people were residing with each other. There were many, several uh, religious communities residing in India very peacefully, harmoni harmoniously. But we can say that this communal ideology become a product of the modern times in India, which came with the advent of the Britishers in our country. So the communalism in India largely was product of the communal policies, sorry, colonial policies towards different communities, especially after the 1857 revolt. So as we all know about 1857 revolt, which was termed as the first war of independence by B.D. Savarkar. So it was the revolt which was fought by Rani Jhasi, then Bahadur Shah Zafar, and there was also the incident where uh, Mangal Pandey was also uh, attached with this, uh, the Sepoy mutiny, uh, in other words. So this 1857 revolt, after this, the there were several policies. The uh, colonial empire was uh, actively uh, doing or uh, they were uh, implying those policies in India, which were, diff which was a, uh, like which uh, gave rise to this communal ideology. The challenges faced by the colonial rulers in the later half of the 19th century became the reason for them to devise policies that promoted communism. So earlier uh, there was a uh, time when uh, both the religions, mainly the uh, Muslims and the Hindus, uh, they were uh, living uh, very peacefully even other religions and all were living very peacefully, but because of the challenges faced by the nationalism and other activities of the Indians, these colonial rulers, they tried to devise policies that promoted communalism. And it also, we can say that they were devising this policy just to break the unity between the religious communities already existing in our country. To criticize the colonial administration, there was the emergence of a new intelligentsia, which was a product of new English education. So there were many people in our country who uh, started uh, getting enrolled in the education field and uh, they were getting English education. So they uh, becomes a group that means a new intelligentsia who tried to, uh, who was criticizing the colonial administration and their policies, they sought to generate national consciousness against the colonial administration. So to generate a uh, 
national consciousness, a sense of nationalism, a belongingness among people. So they sought to try to generate this consciousness against the colonial administration. The colonial authorities responded to the challenge of growing national consciousness being generated by the efforts of the new intelligentsia through the following strategies. So they tried to respond with these following strategies. Let's see what are these strategies. Debunking the notion that Indians who had multiple diversities could be united as a nation. The first thing that they did was that there was a notion uh, that uh, being uh, there are so many diversities residing in India. So there was a notion regarding that that we could be staying here unitedly. But they debunked this notion that Indians could reside with multiple diversities or they could be united as a nation. Second, what they responded by creating a colonial knowledge. Third, by highlighting differences among people which existed on the basis of religion, caste, language, etc. So to break the unity among the Indians, uh, which was very much increasing at that point of time because uh, we were uh, trying to challenge, trying to criticize the colonial empire in our country. So at that point of time, they started highlighting what are the differences between people which exist on these lines like religions, class, caste, language, etc. By next, uh, what uh, they responded by introducing religious based representation in the legislative and political bodies. So to create this division, what they did, they provided religious based representation separate from each other. So let's talk about the communalism and the state. So communalism often leads to communal violence. As uh, nowadays, whatever we have heard about communalism, it is all about violence between different religious communities. So there are several examples of communal violence in India. Uh, many times we can say that there are many uh, riots happened in our country since its inception. Like in uh, during partition, there was a very communal, uh, strong communal violence that was going on between Hindus, Sikhs and uh, Muslims. Even also in the year 1984, uh, because of the Operation Blue Star and after the death of Indira Gandhi, there were Hindu Sikh riots also. So there were many examples of communal violence that happened in our country. Communal violence is also a result of intermingling of religion and politics. This point is very important because many times we have seen that it is the communal riots or the communal violence erupts because of the intermingling of the religion with politics. So in the post-independent India, communalism has become part of the competitive electoral policies. So as we can see that it in, involves politics inside it. So communalism has become a part of the competitive electoral politics. According to K. N. Panikar, politics and communalism have become complementary reinforcing each other in the post-independence India. So whatever we have uh, read, uh, was reading right now, so K. N. Panikar also said that, that communalism and politics are complementary with each other and they are reinforcing each other in the post-independence period in India. It can devise policies which can either stop or encourage communalism. So these policies, whatever the uh, politicians are making policies, this can either stop communalism or encourage communalism. It can also play partisan role in communal politics. So this is what about the communalism and the state. The nature of state's role on communalism depends on the nature of pressure of social groups on it and composition of the personal in the state institutions and political concept. So what is the role of state in this communalism? So it is said that it depends upon the nature of the pressure of the social groups on it and also the composition of the personnel in the state institutions. In a democratic society such as India, the state functions under pressure of different social forces. So there are uh, different social forces in India which uh, under which the democratic society or the state functions. 
so it becomes a site of multiple ideologies and tendencies including secularist and communalist so the state comprises or the state become a site of multiple ideologies whether it is secularist or communalist so let's talk about what is the role of media in communalism so media in both its traditional and newer forms helped ideologies and ideas to spread as we all know that media is a communication uh, between the uh, general people and all the uh, news that happened in our society so they are the one who communicate between the incident and the people so while media plays a decisive role in generating awareness among the people on several occasions it has contributed to the spread of communal divide in the country so as we all know that it is the media who provides us awareness who provides us information about so many things but it also in several occasions contributed in the spread of the communal violence in the country in relation to communalism in india the media plays an influential role in creation and spread of communalism so many times we have seen that media plays a very crucial role in spreading the communalism communalism or creating it so its role becomes crucial in reporting explaining and commenting on communal riots or violence so whatever they are doing they are explaining or reporting or commenting on those communal uh, issues it become very crucial or about the reasons for occurrence of the communal violence role of leaders of different political parties and communities so they play a very crucial and essential role in this matters so the media includes print media newspapers magazines electronic media like tv and social media social media is also becoming a very uh, like a platform which spread many rumors regarding this so in the recent past fake news have become quite frequent to arouse communal passion in the society so in social media we can often see that there are many fake newses which spreads like fire so because of this uh, rumors there are also uh, conditions or situations where the communal uh, passion in the society aroused this was all about communalism now we will be moving forward to unit 15 that is parties and party system this chapter is very important uh, from a uh, exam point of view so please uh, have a very deep look in this chapter so in introduction party system in a democracy normally refers to the pattern of interaction and competition between political parties so as we all know that every country has some or the other kind of political parties there are many countries where there is mainly two parties by party system it is known as whereas in india it is a multi party system that means there are multiple political parties which contest elections on a regular basis so what do you mean by party system party system generally refers to the pattern of interaction and competition between these political parties in india the pattern of interaction and competition among political parties has given way to multi party system so these interactions and competition among the political parties gave rise to multi party system in india over time so in multi party system there is free competition among political parties as we all know that in a democracy to run perfectly there should be free and fair elections happening every uh, like uh, in every time like uh, regular basis on regular basis it should be happen so there is a free competition among political parties occurred but it was the international congress which enjoyed a dominant position both in terms of the number of seats held in the parliament and the state legislative assemblies so there is a reason why this international congress enjoyed a dominant position since such a long time because it originated at the time when india was going through the colonial period uh, we have seen 1857 revolt the sepoy mutiny after that a people started uniting against the colonial government and as a result of which in 1885 the indian national congress was established and since then it was working for the 
freedom movement of India. So that is the reason that they have a legacy from the uh, colonial period where they were fighting for the people. They were wanted to have more say in the British government. And then later on, uh, with the advent of Gandhi, there were several movements that happened in our country. And then finally, they went for a uh, uh, quit India movement where they were adamant that now you have to leave our country. So this is the reason why Congress enjoyed a dominant position since a very long time in our country because uh, during the time when India got independence, there were no other country, uh, sorry, no other political party like Congress uh, which could compete with Congress. So Rajni Kothari coined the term the Congress system. This is very important. And Jones called it a Congress dominated system. So because uh, that there was a domination of this Congress party for a very long time in our Indian history, it is coined by Rajni Kothari as the Congress system. And Jones called it as Congress dominated system. So enormous change have taken place in the party system in recent years. So we are almost have uh, so we have almost uh, experienced seventy five years of independence, and uh, it's a very huge time where we can say that there are many changes that happened over time in our party system. So these changes started taking place from nineteen sixty seven onwards, but these have become much more pronounced since the late eighties <coughs> and early nineteen nineties. So we can say that uh, these changes were started from 1967 onwards, but more recently it can be more uh, like it was more visible and more pronounced since the late 80s and early 1990s. So in this uh, unit, uh, in today's session, we will be uh, reading and we will be discussing about these things in detail. So the party system has moved away from one party dominated system to a multi-party system. So earlier, India was basically a one-party dominated system. And what was that one party? It was the Indian National Congress, which was dominating the political system in our country. But with time, gradually, India moved from one-party dominated system to a multi-party system. It also referred to as a federalized party system or a coalition party system. So uh, earlier it was uh, there like a majority party came in uh, the Lok Sabha where they were ruling, came in the government. But later on, we also witnessed many times that there was a coalition party because there were no party which was gaining majority. So in that matter, there, uh, there was coalition between various political parties. Since 2014, the Bharatiya Janata Party has emerged as the single most dominant party in India. So there were many debates in the late 1990s that whether India will again uh, vote for a majority party or not, or, uh, or coalition government will be the future. But with the advent of Bharatiya Janata Party with thumping majority in the year 2014, it emerged as a single most dominant party. And again, that debate was uh, vanished that whether India was only run by a coalition government. So that uh, victory of Bharatiya Janata Party changed this uh, debate. So the regional and state parties have grown enormously in recent years. So not only there was a growth of national parties, but regional parties and state parties have tremendously, uh, enormously grown in these years. And we will be talking about this in our uh, next slides. So they play a very crucial role in shaping the party system in many of the Indian states. So earlier it was only Congress, which was very dominated, not only in the center, but also in the states. But gradually there were rise of several regional political parties, which are now playing a very important role in not only the states, but also in the national level. So let's talk about the classification of political parties. In India, political parties are classified in two ways. One by the academics, academicians, another by the election commission of India. 
So the classification has been done in two ways by the academicians or the academics and the another is the election commission of India. The former, the academicians or the academics uh, classification is that party is based on factors such as their regional support base, policies, ideologies. The election commission of India classifies them according to percentage of valid vote polls by them in the Vidhan Sabha or Lok Sabha election in a specific number of states. So it classifies political parties into three categories. So the election commission of India classifies these political parties into three categories that is national, state and registered parties. So national, state, national political parties, state political parties and registered political parties. Its definition of state parties is most elaborate. So, in the definition of a party to be called a state party, it must have been engaged in political activity for at least five years and must have won either 4% of the seats in a general election or 3% in the state election. So, what is the criteria for a party to become a state party? Either it has uh, to it has to be politically active for five years and must have won either 4% of seats or three, oh, sorry, either 4% of seats in general election or 3% of seats in the state elections. Also, it must have had the support of 6% of votes cast. So, these are the criteria for a party to become a state party. The parties which are called state parties by the Election Commission of India are generally referred to as general uh, regional parties in academic and popular discussion so we have often used this term regional parties so they are basically state parties but in academics and in popular discussion we called it as regional parties so oliver oliver heath and yogendra yadav consider those parties as regional parties whose social base are restricted to one or two states so what Yogendra Yadav and Oliver Heath talks about, they say that regional party has their social base that is restricted to either one or two states. So this definition takes into consideration only the social base of a party and its area of operation. So according to these thinkers and these uh, academicians, the definition regarding the regional parties that is uh, that they only consider the social base of the party and the area of operation where they are active so this was all about the state parties so a national party is recognized as a national party if it is recognized as a state party in more uh, than four state four, four or more states so if a party is recognized as state party in four or more states then it will become a national party what about registered party a registered party is a party that is neither recognized as a state or national party but is registered with the election commission so there are several political parties that couldn't belong to these two categories of national or state parties so but they are registered with the election commission so that is why they are known as the registered party such parties are also termed as unrecognized parties because people don't recognize them because they are not that much popular and because they were not taking uh, active uh, part in politics. So that is why they are often termed as unrecognized parties. <coughs> the definition provided by the election commission of a regional party is not very satisfactory. So the definition provided by this election commission about regional party, it was not very satisfactory. Since the definition takes into consideration the past performance of a political party, it is not accepted as a proper definition by the academicians. So because the definition which election commission uh, provides uh, for the regional parties, they considered the past performance of that political party, that is why this is not acceptable by the academicians. They consider those parties as regional parties whose base and activities are restricted to a particular state and rooted in both regional aspirations and grievances. So for academicians, what does a regional party mean? 
first of all they must be restricted to a particular state and a particular region and also these parties are those which will be rising or raising the voice for the regional aspirations and grievances so whatever problems that place is facing so these political parties are supposed to take that forward and raise that voice so the support base of a regional party is limited to a particular state because it identifies itself with the region's culture language religion etc so also these regional party has a particular support base because uh, they identify themselves uh, identify itself with the regions the particular regions culture language religion etc it also presents the regional perspective vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the center and other states and these parties use region and language effectively for electoral benefit so basically we can say that the national parties uh, generally they work on uh, either uh, english or hindi uh, like that but these regional parties they use regional languages so for example if there is a regional party in tamil nadu they will be using tamil language to uh, mobilize voters and they will be using the uh, grievances of that particular tamil region or uh, the problems faced by those tamil people so these things will be the issues that they will be working upon so this also electoral electorally benefits them a political party to be recognized as a regional party must satisfy these three specific criteria so to become a regional party there must be some criteria so uh, it has some three specific criteria that we will be talking now so the first a regional party restricts its area of action to a single region which in the prevailing indian situation means a state so these regional parties restrict their areas into a single region which is now in indian uh, situation it is known as states secondly the parties of this kind typically articulate and seek to defend a region based ethnic or religio cultural identity so what is the aim of these regional uh, political parties they basically uh, try to defend the region based ethnic or religio cultural identity thirdly by their very nature regional parties are primarily concerned with the local or state level grievances so whatever the what was the matter of their concern that is the local and state level grievances which people are facing in that particular area let's talk about party system in indian states state party system in india have developed in close connection and interaction with the national party system so state party system also uh, it has a very close connection with the national party system the closeness of relationship between the party systems and the national party system has been termed as a combination of the state party system by some observers in the recent years so this is uh, natural considering that india consists of different states yes we all know that there are many states in india around 28 and the changes in the national party system has affected the state party system so whatever change is happening in the national party system they are impacting the state party system either positively or negatively and in turn transformation in the nature of party competition at the state level had affected the national party system substantially so these kind of transformation in the state level they also affect the national party politics so the second development however is more pronounced in recent years because of the spectacular growth of the regional and the state parties in indian political party system so there was a spectacular growth in the regional party system with time so now let's talk about the era of the congress dominance so we have already learned that rajni kothari termed it as a congress system so since its inception it was the congress which was ruling the country with majority there were many uh, there was many other parties also but they were not that much powerful like congress so that they can defeat it so the party system in india before 1967 has been a system of congress dominance 
so since uh, 1947 from the year india got independence and in 1952 the first general elections that happened that took place in our country after that till 1967 the party system in india was the congress dominant party system it has been also referred to as the congress dominated system or the congress system as we have learned that till the fourth general elections which were held in 1967 so the first general election happened in the year 1952 uh, it was started from the late 1951 but major uh, major uh, election dates were in the early part of the 1952 that it that is why it is known as the 1952 general elections so till the fourth general elections which were held in 1967 state party systems in india like that of the national party system was dominated by the overwhelming presence of the congress party so not only at the national level but at the state level also there was a strong presence of the congress party the congress party dominated in almost all the states but the domination of the congress was not uniform in all states so basically they were dominating in all the states uh, at that point of time also remember there were not so many states like today at that point of time there were very few like 16 17 or around 20 so with time states uh, were uh, uh, separated from uh, existing state and the number of states increased with time so at that point of time there were not so many states like today we have the congress for example had to face the toughest competition in the former princely states so as we all know that india was formerly a princely state there were many kingdoms uh, before uh, the advent of the britishers which uh, created an uh, uh, um, like it uh, it was an environment where the administration was united for the entire country before that uh, people were uh, living in a princely states so the congress faced a tough competition in these princely states which uh, was around during partition it was around 360 approx princely states that existed at that point of time that acceded in the indian union yes we all know that princely states was acceded by the with the indian union there were few princely states that that uh, was creating problem in acceding with india like junagadh uh, uh, then uh, there was jammu and kashmir and uh, so whereas in other states it almost had an impeccable hegemon so in these kinds of princely states there were so many princely states at that point of time congress was facing a problem but other than that in almost other states it has an impeccable hegemon so congress ruled almost all the states except jammu and kashmir where the national conference had a domineering presence since uh jammu kashmir uh, uh, was a uh, a part of India through the instrument of accession signed between the government of India and the king of Jammu Kashmir, uh, Raja Hari Singh. Uh, since then, uh, it it has a separate, it was having a separate constitution, separate flag, and uh, also the policies and uh, whatever the decision is taken by the Indian parliament was not applicable there without the state uh, legislatives of uh, uh, their involvement. So except in jammu kashmir congress almost ruled everywhere so in jammu kashmir it was the national conference party which had a very domineering presence kerala was also an exception because in the second general elections in 1957 the cpi emerged victorious and formed a government along with its allies for two years till it was dissolved arbitrarily in 1959 so in Kerala, we have seen that there was a strong presence of the Communist Party of India and the Congress was such a dominant force that it secured comfortable majorities in almost all the elections to the Lok Sabha and the state assemblies in the year 1952, 57 and 62. So electoral data indicate that the performance of the Congress in the assembly election was slightly poorer than in the Lok Sabha elections. So uh, Congress was, uh, the performance of Congress was uh, very good in both, but if we analyze it perfectly, so it is slightly poorer in the assembly elections than in the Lok Sabha elections. This was because of the nature of resistance offered by the opposition, 
which included the state and regional formations. So because of there were uh, very small parties which were working on this regional aspirations. So that is why there was a competition between uh, these parties and the Congress. Opposition to Congress in the assembly elections was much more severe than in the Lok Sabha elections. So the dominance of Congress in the state started crumbling uh, from the mid 1960s. Uh, now we are talking about the breakdown of the Congress system that is from the year 1967 to 1989. What happened that the Congress was breaking down? The fourth general elections of the 1967 marked the intensification of this change. So since 67, we have learned that Congress was, has a, was having a dominant position in our Indian political system. But since 1967 elections, it sees an intensified change. So the party system that emerged in the states after that and continued till 1989 may be referred to as a bipolarized one in which a weak Congress party was confronted with a united opposition in most of the states. So this was a time when uh, Congress was facing a very strong opposition. The following pattern of bipolarization was seen in the states for the general elections from the period from 1967 to 1989. In Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Himachal Pradesh and Delhi, the competition was between the Congress and the BJS and BJP. So BJS here means the uh, Bharatiya Jansang, which was uh, there. And uh, from here only the BJP was emerged in the year 1980. So it was uh, initially BJS like uh, Bharatiya Jansang and later BJP Bharatiya Janta Party. In Kerala, Tripura and West Bengal, the competition has been between the Congress and the left. So we can see that in different states, there was a different kind of competition for the Congress from different political parties. In Punjab, Jammu Kashmir, Andhra Pradesh, Assam and Goa, a Congress regional party led alliance emerged, though the BJP also gained substantially. So in these uh, states like Punjab, Jammu Kashmir, Andhra, Assam and Goa, uh, there was a Congress regional party led alliance. But BJP also gained in these parties, in, uh, in these uh, states. In the northeastern states, the contest was mainly between the Congress and a variety of regional parties or their alliances. So in the northeastern states of our country, the contest was between the Congress and the regional parties or their alliances. In Tamil Nadu, the competition has mainly between the DMK and the AIA DMK. So what does DMK stand for? It is Dravida Munetra Kazakam and AIA DMK is an All India Anna Dravida Munetra Kazakam. So these were very strong parties in Tamil Nadu, which was giving a tough competition to the Congress. Finally, in seven major states, Odisha, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Haryana, Gujarat and Karnataka, the Congress retained dominance. So these were the seven states where Congress could remain a dominant position. So Congress had never secured more than 50% of the votes either in the parliamentary or the assembly elections except in some states but has always secured huge majorities in terms of seats. So this is also a very important fact. This is indicative of the fact that though significant opposition to the Congress existed at the state level, Due to fragmentation in their ranks and because of the rule associated with the first past the post system, the Congress always emerged victorious in terms of seats. So, whether they are getting uh, vote uh, share uh, much or not, but they were getting a very large number of seats because of the first past the post system. So, it almost uh, emerged as victorious in terms of seats. In 1967 elections, in fact, put an end, at least for a temporary period, to this disunity in the opposition. In post-1967 period, saw the emergence of the anti-Congress alliances in state, after state, and this altered the nature of the contest, particularly for the assemblies. So, since 1967, there was the emergence of anti-Congress alliances. These developments result in the defeat of the Congress in as many as eight out of 16 states of the Indian Union. So this was a very remarkable change that happened in our country at that point of time.
there was also a marked decline in the vote share of the Congress party in the parliamentary election from 44.72% in 1962 to 40.7% in 1967. The states entered into a bipolarized system, the principal contenders being the Congress and almost a united opposition in many of the prominent Indian states. So the opposition was united against the Congress. This system continued almost till the end of the 1980s, though on occasions, for example, 1971 and 72, the Congress was able to restore its predominant position at the central and to a lesser extent at the state level. And the reason behind that was the India-Pakistan war due to the Bangladesh liberation crisis. So this was the time when uh, India was facing a war with Pakistan to liberate Bangladesh. So at that point of time, the Congress party uh, came into power with a thumping majority. In Northern India, in Uttar Pradesh, the Congress from the assembly election of 1974 onwards was never able to secure 40% of the votes. Not even in the elections of the 1985 that were held after the parliamentary elections of 1984, in which the Congress recorded a landslide victory. One of the other parties like BJS, BJP, Janta Party and later various factions of the Janta Party, Lok Dal, etc. challenged the hegemony of the Congress. So these parties were challenging the hegemony of the Congress. There was a considerable challenge to Congress from the Bharatiya Jansang or BJP, NCO, JNP, Independence, Lok Dal, etc. In the South, in Tamil Nadu, the party competition since 1967 narrowed down to a two-party competition, first between the Congress and the DMK, and then between the DMK and the AIA DMK. So initially it was between Congress and DMK, but later on uh, with, from within the DMK, a new party emerged that is All India Anna Dravida Munetra Kazakam, and uh, from that onwards, it was between the challenge or the competition was between DMK and AIA DMK. In Andhra Pradesh, the Congress's popular vote share had started declining from the 1978 elections and entered into a bipolar competition between uh, from 1983 onwards. In West Bengal, the Congress lost its hegemonic position from 1967 onwards and saw bipolarization from the elections of 1971. So we can see that how uh, different states were seeing how the Congress system is breaking down. So it was in this period 1967 to 89 that all these changes were happening. Thus in the country as a whole, barring a few marginal states that remained effectively under the control of the Congress, a bipolar system of party competition emerged. Now let's see what happened after 1989 towards a fragmentation of state party system. The party system at both levels, nations and states moved towards a fragmentation from the late 1980s or more particularly from the 1990s. At the national level, there was has been an end, an, uh, end of the one party dominance and the movement towards a multi-party system. So this was a time when India was moving towards a multi-party system. This trend started in 1967 at the state level. So this uh, thing that uh, uh, this uh, system of multi-party system started in, at the state level in the year 1967, but at overall or at the national level, it started from the 1990s onwards. However, the system that exists in the states are different from the national level. Many states have moved towards a two-party system and probably this is the most prominent feature of the party competition at the state level. At the national level, since the 1990s, the competition has narrowed down to two different alliances, one led by the BJP and the other by the Congress. At the state level, the competing parties differ from state to state, but in most of the state, it is the two-party system. So the parties varies from state to state, but almost the party system was two-party system. In many states, it is a multi-party system where the important contenders are the Congress, the BJP and the state regional parties. In some states, the competition is primarily between state or regional parties, though national parties also occupy a significant space in those states. 
so they uh, because uh, for that there are multiple causes the most important of them are the declining of the congress in the states second is the spectacular growth of the bjp particularly in the hindi heartland and some other states and thirdly the growth of the prominence of the regional or state parties so the declining of congress became more spectacular after indira gandhi assumed the leadership of the party zoya hassan argued that the congress declined because of its inability to maintain the political basis of its coalition it is true that the party's ability to mobilize voters at the lower level during the elections whether at the state or the parliamentary elections declined significantly in the late 1980s and 1990s thus the congress became a much reduced force at the state level since the late 1980s the share of votes and seats the congress captured in the lok sabha and more particularly in the assembly election in the state sharply declined in the last decade of the 20th century its performance in the assembly election in some of the prominent uh, states like uttar pradesh congress remained a much reduced force as its vote share declined from 15 from uh, 15.08% in 1993 to 8.96% in 2002 in andhra pradesh the largest of the south indian states the congress returned to power in 1989 but it lost in the 1994 elections and remained in opposition till 2004 in bihar the votes of the percentage of the congress slumped from 24.78% in 1990 to 11.06% in 2000 so it reduced to half and the seats uh, seats were from 71 to 23 so it reduced similarly in maharashtra it lost its hegemony in the 1990s completely in tamil nadu the congress had lost its dominant position much earlier to the two regional forces that is dmk and aia dmk similarly in west bengal it declined its uh, position declined in uh, 1990s due to the split and the subsequent formation of the trinamool congress the expansion of the bjp in the recent times has been much more dramatic than the decline of the congress as we all know the expansion has mainly due to the decline of the congress the aggressive mobilization strategy based on the hindutva ideology which adopted uh, which they adopted from the late 1980s and its strategy of alliance formation so these were the reason why bjp emerged so powerful at the national level in lok sabha it increased its seats from two seats in 1984 to 182 seats in the year 1998 elections that catapulted to the position of a ruling party however this onward march of the bjp was halted in the 2004 general elections it established domination in 2014 and 2019 recent elections in the assembly elections the performance of the bjp in the 1990s was equally spectacular it increased its share of votes and seats in uttar pradesh uh, in the 1990s its vote share and seats shared remained almost same so the third interrelated development that has taken place in the recent time is the expansion of the regional parties largely at the cost of congress in the states as a result they have increased their presence in the national legislature since the 1996 elections and due to this they have come to play a very crucial role so election data indicate that these parties increased their presence in the lok sabha and it is due to these interrelated developments that the party system in the states had undergone significant transformation the system that was congress dominated has become fragmented with the features of bipolarity in this fragmented system the competition is primarily between two parties whether national or regional but there are others who occupy a significant position in the party politics so the competition at the state level in recent years and the party systems that has emerged as a result may be classified into four main categories the first category belongs to himachal pradesh madhya pradesh rajasthan and gujarat these states are essentially two party states it includes the category in uh, west bengal kerala tripura maharashtra and punjab which are essentially bipolar and these states either two alliances or one party by an alliance of two or smaller parties dominated politics in the second category belongs to those states like karnataka bihar and odisha 
Thirdly, there are states like Uttar Pradesh where a four-cornered contest exists between the BJP, Samajwadi Party, Bahujan Samaj Party, and the Indian National Congress. So the fourth category belongs to those states in which a bipolar or two-party system exists, but there is also an increased growth of a third party. So the third party may not be strong enough to capture large number of seats, but has a significant vote share. So this was all about our uh, today's session. So with this, I end this uh, subject that is Indian government and politics. This was the last session for this paper.